Thank you. Um, I think I'll try to round out the discussion today with opportunities of digitally enabled pathways and in particular initiatives that are underway to use large scale data and data science to understand the long term impacts of COVID-19, particularly PASC or post acute symptomatic COVID. Next slide. I think uh, many have touched already this morning on the, the challenges of diagnosing new diseases. And in particular in PASC, there's, there's a few things that are making it even more challenging. Um, the conditions are evolving very rapidly. The, the diagnosis of PASC and the expression and the frequency, uh, the incidence and, and prevalence of PASC is, seems to be very dependent on variants and new variants continue to emerge. It's a cluster of symptoms and conditions. Um, and of course, diagnostic uncertainty um, when there are, are um, uh, uh, expressions of disease that are not measurable can be very, very challenging. There's limited research ready data and uh, in oh, the opening comments, we heard about silos between patients that, sorry, there's a typo, they, not patents, patients, physicians, informaticists, scientists, and data sources. I would layer on this two other things. Patients and physicians have never had seamless communication. And in the setting of disparities and inequities, um, that is all made uh, that much more severe. In October 1st of this past year, a new ICD-10 code was established for PASC, um, but it was very generic. And there is there are many questions about what is PASC? How frequently does it occur? What, what is the cluster of signs or symptoms that qualify a patient for PASC? And what are the optimal therapeutics for PASC? In order to help push forward answering those questions, the National Institutes of Health funded a very large initiative called RECOVER. Um, and Re RECOVER is uh, dedicating money in several different ways a lot of it in clinical trials um, in which cohorts of patients will be followed over time for the potential development of PASC, but also a significant investment in large-scale health data science. And I will, in the next several slides, describe um, the data science work. I'm the PI of one of those grants. Uh, and um, talk about how data science uh, can really help foster um, definitive and more rapid uh, diagnoses. Next slide. Um, the, the, I am uh, part of PCORNET, which is the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network. It was established in 2014 by PCORI. We have sites across the country, and there are 41 sites that are enriched with data that will be participating in these recover work in order to help further our understanding of PASC. Next slide. Uh, PCORnet has electronic healthcare record on over 100 million patients represented with 15 billion rows of data. There are many different data types and they're listed here. Uh, PCORNET has supported over 3,000 studies, has laboratory um, positive uh, COVID-19 data on an over 1 million patients as of November of 2021. And very importantly, the cornerstone of PCORNET is patient-centeredness. And so patients are really the North Star of this entire network. They participate in the leadership and governance. They participate in study approval. They participate in designing uh, uh, questions and in every aspect of the work that is done. Next slide. Um, right now, there's 55 ongoing studies for COVID-19 in PASC across PCORNET. Here's a sampling representation. Next slide and a sampling of publications that have come out of PCORnet um, over the last, for, for, the, uh, for both COVID-19 and PASC um, since March of 2020. Next slide. So let me pivot to 
a very specific example, um, which is what we're building in this in this initiative, because I think grounding how large scale data can be used to Im develop scientific evidence um, is is. Uh, um, in some ways, a, a very untangible concept. So what, this is what we're doing. We have 41 health systems that have standardized their electronic health record and other real world data, things like patient reported outcomes, social determinants in a standardized format. We then ingest that data in a secure um, uh, and co confidential way. We extract key data elements, we transform it, curate it, and then go back to the sites after we run quality assurance set checks and say, you know, the, this laboratory test, for example, is not representing what it's stated to represent. Could you work on that? And so I think of this as a learning data cycle akin to a learning health system cycle where we, we continue to improve the data. This leads to a centralized data repository, and I'm using this study as one example, but there are now thousands of such large-scale data repositories across the country that are driving evidence. Those data repositories, depending on how they're structured, can do a variety of things. Um, and I'll show a couple of examples because I think it, it sort of puts, um, puts meat on the bones. Um, the repository itself can be visualized, and I'll show you an example of, of that with a COVID-19 database. It can be queried. This means running very simple, um, uh, often straightforward analytical um, requests against the centralized data repository, returning counts, sometimes returning more sophisticated data than just counts, but not, uh, not, as, um, not flexible enough to allow rigorous data science. Cohort identification, um, including computable phenotypes, and then really engaging in robust science. Next slide. This is an example of visualization. So this is a, um, uh, uh, a database uh, that's actually based in New York City, uh, which has multiple academic health centers contributing. The top line shows the incidence of COVID-19 in, um, in this database. And the bottom table shows the expression of past post-acute COVID with clusters of conditions in rank order. Um, I, we can hone in on one time or another. So for example, if you hone in in April, 2020 versus April of 2021, the representation of PASS will vary. These types of visualizations are very helpful for clinicians, but also very helpful for scientists as they try to generate hypotheses and understand disease. Next slide. Uh, examples of queries, um, we right now are characterizing uh, about a million adult patients with PASC on demographics, time trends, comorbidities, the acuity of their COVID-19 index illness in terms of care settings, the, the use of medications and how that affects PASC and vaccination status. Next slide. Computable phenotypes. So this is where I think the science can really be exceedingly helpful to clinicians. Um, what we're doing right now is we've reviewed uh, 200 plus studies on PASS. There, you know, in, in, in the last year, there have been more than 200 studies in the literature about post-acute COVID. We are looking at data and developing data-driven insights about computable phenotypes, and then soliciting expert clinician input. Right now, we have developed a screening computable phenotype for PASC. It consists of 6,000 diagnostic clusters. That's not a particularly big phenotype. It's certainly not small, but it's not particularly big and has resulted in 10 key areas of focus, not surprisingly, the, the organ systems that, that one would hypothesize would be involved. Things like neurological issues, mental health issues, uh, immunologic, musculoskeletal, and so on. 
Next slide. And in our first study of using the screening CP, we studied um, uh, a couple hundred thousand, uh, 100, 168,000 patients who had COVID-19 positivity. And our main outcome was a new symptom or condition post-COVID that was absent pre-COVID. Surprisingly, 57% of adults had a new symptom or condition. That percentage went up when we looked at hospitalized patients to 73%. Next slide. Um, um, and here's a depiction of the symptoms and conditions where uh, uh, PASC was expressed. Um, this is uh, 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 being published in, in uh, the JAMA uh, Network Open uh, Journal uh, later this month. This shouldn't be construed as an estimate of PASC prevalence. That will be more accurate with a longer follow-up period and more nuanced past definitions. But it starts to become, I think, very informative to clinicians as we start to think about how do we approach PASC? What are the different expressions of PASC? How do we know if a patient in front of us has PASC? And how do we end up with more diagnostic certainty? Um, and I think that that's it for me for slides, and I look forward to the discussion ahead.